our talk on nostalgia. This is the English department. Dr. Baker, Dr. Bilbro, Dr. Klein, and Dr. Morris. And I'm Dr. Morris Mobile. And we think that Spring Harbor University uh, really emphasizes the the, uh, the joy of community. And so we wanted to gather the community of alumni here. So you may see people who are current students, who, people who are uh, early grads, and then people who are alumni from years gone past. So welcome everyone. Nostalgia is part of having this great college experience and then looking back on it and coming back to homecoming and kind of understanding what happened back there in college. At least that's what I'm gonna talk about. So these <laughs> men are gonna talk about all aspects of nostalgia, uh, probably the literary tradition of nostalgia and all kinds of good things to get us to think. So welcome today. And Dr. Baker, why don't you come up and start and I'll follow you. I'm wearing a jersey from high school soccer. So this is just entirely a talk about my stats from my senior year in high school. Um, you might be even more surprised to hear the first words out of my mouth. Wendell Berry's short story, <laughs> The Wild Birds, begins with a rather ominous opening line. Where have they gone? Wheeler thinks, but he knows. Gone to the cities forever or for the day. Gone to the shopping center gone to the golf courses, gone to the grave. In one fell swoop, the narrator points a grim picture of cities, shopping centers, and golf courses, ending with, ending with the full stop of the grave. Lines like these, the critic might say, are proof that Barry's imagination is stuck in the past, propping up the vestiges of an agricultural way of life no longer viable in a modern world. And surely such nostalgia is unhelpful for those of us who live in the ever-changing present. The world is mutable. We can't get back to what once was. We must press on, heads high, eyes forward. And so, readers of Barry's fiction must come to terms with the reality that the voice of Port William often calls upon us to cast our vision toward things that have passed away, toward people who have gone to their graves. It is thus understandable that readers um, may find his fiction to be too concerned with the past, to be suffering from a myopic vision stuck like Dante's diviners with our heads on our shoulders facing in the wrong direction. But I think that's an unfair, you might be shocked to know that, I think that's an unfair <laughs> critique of Barry's fiction. And despite the somber tone at the outset of that particular story, it's a tone that is not ultimately pessimistic. Like much of Barry's fiction, uh, this story, The Wild Birds, is concerned with the passing away of dear things and the thankfulness, forgiveness, and hope that those in the community, Port William, and we readers nonetheless practice. In fact, Barry's nostalgia fits well within the long tradition of literary lamentation that reaches back to some of the earliest surviving poetry in the English language. And if you have me in early Brit Lit, we read a bunch of that. In fact, I've argued elsewhere that nostalgia in Barry's fiction is in fact teaching us to remember rightly those who have gone before us. Not so that we might turn back the clocks to live in a fabled past, but so that we might find hope in its memory for today. And such nostalgia ties us to the oldest poetic literature of our language. So when most of us hear nostalgia, um, in, and when we use it in the English language, we do so to describe a sentimentalizing affection for the past. Oh, he's so nostalgic. A way of remembering that focuses on the good, but rarely enough uh, on the bad. We might even feel that a person who waxes nostalgic has lost touch with reality. If we could just get back to how things used to be, whatever that is. We can't change the past, so dwelling on it is a fool's errand. But at one point in the history of our language, nostalgia carried with it a rather positive meaning, longing for one's home. And I think it is in this vein when we think of nostalgia not as a quaint emotion, but as a deep desire for homecoming, that we're right to describe fiction that dwells on the past as nostalgic. Such nostalgic stories have a long history in the Western world. For instance, the theme of Nostos, which is a story of homecoming, was common in Greek literature. And if you've ever read the Odyssey, you know that the Odyssey is a prolonged Nostos, and it culminates at the great rooted bed around which Odysseus's entire world has been built. 
And perhaps the most infamous nostos is in Aeschylus' Agamemnon. And if you take us in the world, that you often get to read these stories. And, and this begins uh, with a tragic gnosis that inverts the virtues of the theme. Agamemnon, returned from war, the great general is slain in a bathtub by his wife, Clytemnestra, and her lover, Aegisthus, in his own palace. And so it's to these stories of homecoming, to the image of Odysseus weeping on the headlands of the island, Ogygia, one of my favorite uh, island names, uh, if I'm ranking island names, as he pines for hearth and home, that I think we might do better to trace the journey of our word nostalgia. So here's the last thing I want to say. If we think of nostalgia as a deep longing for home, a lamentation for a familiar order that has passed away, then I think we're able to save it from the dustbin of shallow sentiment, recovering its long history as a part of those stories in which a protagonist imagines the restoration of something dear that has been lost. And because nostalgia is concerned with imagining the goodness of things as they once were, it is at its core an exercise in the virtues of patience, hope, and gratitude. Patience become, because one must suffer the possibility that all may be lost. Hope that though things have changed, they might yet reveal their goodness in new and unexpected ways. And gratitude for those who have gone before and told us stories of their struggles so that we ourselves might find strength to persevere. Indeed, stories of nostalgia make us vulnerable, which is a great word, it means to be wounded, you can be wounded. They inflict on us a double wound though, I think, as we at once feel both the pang of loss for that which we have loved and the pang of joy for having loved it. I didn't know Agamemnon got conked in the bathtub. Harsh. Hey, well, nice to be Always keep your eyes open. <laughs> My first weekend on campus at Spring Arbor College back in 1976, I found myself in the stairwell of Muffet Hall during a game of Capture the Flag, where I met a guy. <laughs> After the game, we talked for what seemed like hours. We struck up a friendship that lasted a lifetime. That was Joel Varland, a player on the soccer team with my brother, Raj. <laughs> you thought I was going to say Robert, but uh, he, he, the best was yet to come. Uh, he told me later he'd asked Raj to introduce us, and Raj told him, you're on your own. Do your own dirty work. <laughs> As it turned out, Joel and I became fast friends. We went to each other's weddings and still see each other's families. Joel, who is professor, a professor at Savannah School of Art and Design, just painted the word to image mural up on the second floor of Sayer de Can, down kind of the English hallway. So was, um, you know what I'm talking about. He was an alum who came back and gave that gift to the university because he loved the school. Earlier that day, the day I met Joel, I had moved into my campus dorm room on Alpha 2, and I remember walking out in Lowell Lounge to see what the action was and meeting Ken Brewer. <laughs> to my memory, it doesn't seem like anyone else was around, and we talked at length about Ken's dating life. <laughs> you can tell him what was important. <laughs> Somehow, I ended up encouraging him to read some Dietrich Bonhoeffer and C.S. Lewis, although he's the one who became the theologian and currently chairs the theology department at Spring Arbor University. Robert and I have been friends with Ken, Joel, and five other Spring Arbor College students doing life together for over 40 years. I think alumni, like Ken and Joel and I, want to come back to homecoming to remember those magical days when we were young and challenged and alive and together with friends. We can get as nostalgic as Wordsworth does in the prelude. Bliss was it in that dawn to be alive and to be young was very heaven. We look back at that time nostalgically because then we were full of anticipation, full of hope and hormones. <laughs> sure that the world was our oyster, ready to be challenged with new ideas, full of our heart's best longings. We look back to college nostalgically because it was so formative. It was a time of ordering our loves, if you will. We worked out our worldview, chose the virtues we wanted to cultivate, chose our mates, 
and decided who we weren't going to marry <laughs> and chose our friends. Classes and professors were a major part of that formation. Last summer, I found a manifesto of sorts written in the front cover of my brother Roger's textbook from Professor Moore's philosophy class, Halverson's Introduction to Philosophy. This is the textbook Mary Darling uses as her example of why not to throw away your college textbooks. <laughs> because last summer I was looking through Roger and Linda's uh, bookshelves in Kansas in, in their home, and I found this manifesto of sorts written in the front of Roger's college textbook that we all used in, the, in our generation, our era used this for intro to philosophy. I, Raj Cameron Moore, commit myself to using the wisdom found in the study of this text to glorify Christ and to become and to seek more fully the kingdom of the Almighty Father. October 1978. And he said he wrote that about four years after he took the class. So he was still reading his textbook. Can you believe that, students? <laughs> of course we forget a lot of it, but some defining moments from college become carriers of the mystery of that period of our lives, the mystery of our personhood, of our holiness, if you will. I think returning to the place where we had the shaping experiences is meaningful because certain places on campus are such powerful reminders and can be iconic. We could meet a bunch of alumni in, in LA or Chicago, but it wouldn't be the same as coming back to campus. Place can be a marker, a carrier of meaning. For me, it was Muffet Stairwell and Lowell Lounge. You have those places on campus too that call up powerful memories. You can even buy a brick from Muffet Hall today. <laughs> <laughs> if you have no money, just go lean up against the wall of what used to be E.P. Hart Auditorium back in the day, and just to feel the vibes. Willa Cather's novel, Lucy Gayhart, depicts a character, Harry Gordon, who returns to the place where Lucy, when she was 13 years old, had skipped over wet cement, leaving three slight footprints in the sidewalk. Later, Lucy dies in a skating accident on a frozen river, but her footprints remain, quote, delicately and clearly stamped in the gray-white composition. The travel of the years had not made them fainter. Harry revisits those footprints stretched in the sidewalk, for nothing else seemed to bring her back so vividly into the living world for a moment. Sometimes when he paused there, he caught for a flash the very feel of her, an urge at his elbow, breath on his cheek, a sudden lightness and freshness like a shower of raindrops. There are other things that remind Harry of this character, but it's the footprints that bring Lucy back most intensely, maybe because those footprints are not just a mental image. Her feet had actually touched the wet cement, and in themselves, the footprints carry the weight of her tangible presence. Places on campus can carry memories that linger like that, because where something happened is as significant as when it happened because tangible things can connect with inner realities. So we come back to campus. We come home for homecoming to revisit the places where our defining moments shaped us. The power of nostalgia can also move us to assess how well we followed the precepts we chose when we were here. In my life choices, have I followed the wisdom I discovered in texts like Halverson? Have I lived deliberately, even if I'm not in the woods with Thoreau? <laughs> At times when my picture of God has been shattered, have I expanded the frame of that picture of God? As J.B. Phillips encouraged me to do in Your God is Too Small. Have I served the work, as Dorothy Sayers teaches, without looking for gratitude or recognition? We're taking stock when we come back to campus. We aren't the same people we were in college, but yes, we recognize ourselves in this place. As T.S. Eliot puts it so well in the four quartets, we will not cease from exploration, and the end of all our exploring will be to arrive where we started 
and know the place for the first time. For those of you who come back, thanks for coming back. I don't go back to my college. It's too painful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Not because they were bad times, because they were good times. I don't go back. So welcome back. <laughs> uh, I uh, must mean it was miserable for you. That's why you're back. Uh, I'm wearing a nostalgic shirt as well, a band T-shirt. Hey, I didn't see you there. <laughs> I come to you today with a simple question: Is Toad the Wet Sprocket the greatest band of all time? No. <laughs> it's quite probable you've never heard of them, which, believe me, has absolutely no bearing whatsoever on the answer to the question. <laughs> if you're like my parents when I was in high school and college, you can't even get past the name, which the band gave themselves when they were 16 years old and in love with Monty Python. <laughs> is Toad the Wet Sprocket the greatest band of all time? It is obviously a matter of taste. If it was simply taste, however, it would not be worth asking, certainly not right now. Your significant other is not the kindest and most attractive person in the world but only a narcissist would try to make you change your mind. Instead, like the ingrown toenail that my brain so often is, the question is more to me, can I ever know Toad the Wet Sprocket is the greatest band of all time? When I hear them, what do I really hear? Do I hear the harmonies, or do I hear being young in the summer again? Do I sing with the melody, or for reliving late nights and breakups and long walks alone imagining passers-by stunned by my obviously genius and moody self? <laughs> <laughs> That's not a lie. That's <laughs> the question for me is not what objects and places I am nostalgic for. I know this already. We know this. Psychologist Petra Giannata calls it the reminiscence bump. That we are biologically wired to remember with greater breadth and feeling our lives between the ages of 12 and 22. Whatever music you're listening to at 15 is staying with you the rest of your life. For better or for worse. <laughs> this is why it comes back like every 30 years when those people have like money to spend and things come back. So the 80s are back now. Because this was when my generation was young. To this part of me, yes, Toad is the greatest band. You have yours and I have mine. Let us move on and be friends, thinking the other has real crap taste in music. <laughs> the real question, however, is what believing Toad the Wet Sprocket is the greatest band does to me right now. What the reminiscence bump does to me, not when I am imagining being 19 again, but when I am actually living life as a 41-year-old man. Is the reminiscence bump a virus? Does it consume everything around it? Or is it an organ, more vital than the other tissue around it, but symbiotic and unified? In Kurt Vonnegut's book, Cat's Cradle, he invents a term for a married couple that is so intimate with one another that they close off from the world. He calls it a dupras. When one member of the dupras dies, the other soon follows. We might believe this is romantic, as in the Ben Folds song, The Luckiest. Ben Folds, good musician, not the greatest band of all time. That's been established. <laughs> <laughs> Do you all know that song? Does it? Yeah. You know the song, The Luckiest. Look it up on your Spotify app. It's very beautiful. The after you look up to it. The dupras is no different for this nostalgia either. It is good that I hold on to this band and call it the greatest in the world, just as it is good that you hold on to your significant other as the kindest and most attractive person in the world. But is there nothing new out there? My children are still under my influence to request the music I'm the one giving. And there's nothing that makes me happier than when they ask for a song by The Clash or Toad or someone like that. But when they are older, and they would, when they present a different world of music to me, will I ask them, or even worse, will I ask only myself, what has Athens to do with Toad the Wet Sprocket? <laughs> if I believe my wife is the kindest and most attractive person in the world, does it require me to believe the rest of the world hostile and ugly? Is that what fidelity means? Students make fun of me for getting older. I do not understand the joke. <laughs> There are wonderful things about getting older. Not giving a crap what the wrong people think. Feeling comfortable in your own skin. And if you're doing things right, you know more beautiful people. 
and you hear more beautiful music. The desire to return, nostalgia, the nostos, in itself is not the problem. It is the, pla it is the deplacing of what isn't in our dupras of nostalgia, of rejecting what I don't know for what gives me safety, to demand that there be only one, to be scared of shading, to need the validation that there is no other option in the world. This is when love turns into a parasite. And like all Duprasses, when one side goes, the other side goes as well. For the record though, Toad the Wet Sprocket is the greatest band, listening party after the talk. Thank you. <laughs> If Jack can talk about Wendell Berry, then I can talk about G.K. Chesterton. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so I'm going to take my talk today from the end of Chesterton's novel, Man Alive, which many of you have read with me. In that novel, the main enigmatic character, Innocent Smith, has left his family in England and walked around the world in order to come back home. As Chesterton says elsewhere, there are only two ways of getting home. One is never to leave. And the second is to walk around the world till you come back to the place you began. So the hero, Innocent Smith, has walked around the world to discover or rediscover his home and his family. He finds himself in the Sierra Nevada talking to a lonely pioneer. Describing his journey, Smith says that he must continue on. Quote, my pilgrimage is not yet accomplished. I have become a pilgrim to cure myself of being in exile. And this confession acknowledges the truth that we all know. And this truth is the reason that we've all come to hear a talk on nostalgia, partly because we hope it isn't true. Maybe there's a solution, but the truth is that we're not home. Chesterton claims that according to Christianity, we were all survivors of a wreck, the crew of a golden ship gone down before the beginning of the world. And at a deep level of our being, we know this dislocation, this ontological loss of both place and time. The way in which even the best things in life are passing. Even the happiest moments in the middle of them, you realize that they'll be over and they'll be gone. And life will have moved on. And so we come to a talk on nostalgia. And as survivors of that wrecked golden ship, we've only got two options, exile or pilgrimage. What are we supposed to do? The pioneer responds to Innocent Smith's pilgrim versus exile dichotomy with a question about the last things, the final things. The pioneer says, quote, my grandmother, he said in a low tone, would have said that we were all in exile and that no earthly house could cure the holy homesickness that forbids us rest. <coughs> now this is true at one level. We're made for God. And until we join the divine dance of the Trinity, we will never be fully home. That's the telos, that's the goal of the human person. And until we realize that goal, we're always going to be missing something. What do we do with our longing for the past then? For the good that we have known? Is it just a distraction? The passing of things ephemeral in the light of eternity? No, says Innocent Smith. Instead, he suggests that God has given us our love of particular times and places as a signpost a stake planted in the ground to bear witness to the fulfillment of all things. Fulfillment not in some abstract or some speculative sense, but in a real and concrete way. The particular joys of our lives will be realized fully in all their depth. Smith says, quote, that if there be a house for me in heaven, it will either have a green lamppost and a hedge or something quite as positive and personal as a green lamppost and a hedge. To reword this for me here today, I would say that heaven, heaven will either have Ormston and the Dining Commons <laughs> or something quite as positive and personal as Ormston and the Dining Commons. Smith continues, I mean that God bade me love one spot and serve it and do all things however wild in praise of it, so that this one spot might be a witness against all the infinities and all the sophistries that paradise is somewhere and not anywhere, is something and not anything. And I would not be so very much surprised if the house in heaven had a green lamppost after all. Our nostalgia ought to orient and direct us not only toward a past, 
which we can never recover, but also toward the life of heaven, in which the good that we've known becomes completely itself. Our longing for our own, for our homes, our suffering for our homes and the good of the past can point us on toward that heavenly harbor where in Julian of Norwich's famous words, all shall be well and all shall be well and all manner of things shall be well. Constantly yeah, that's great. Uh, I'm just going to read one poem, say three things, and then read a prayer. And then are we going to have a kind of a discussion time? Sure. Hey, I might be better. Okay. Uh, I'm not going to mention that guy. So this is a poem by R.S. Thomas, who is a was a Welsh uh, priest. The Bright Field. I have seen the sun break through to illuminate a small field for a while and gone my way and forgotten it. But that was the pearl of great price, the one field that had treasure in it. I realize now that I must give all that I have to possess it. Life is not hurrying on to a receding future, nor hankering after an imagined past. It is the turning aside, like Moses, to the miracle of the lit bush, to a brightness that seemed as transitory as your youth once, but is the eternity that awaits you. Uh, so as, as several people have mentioned, nostalgia can be a sentimental uh, longing for an imagined past, right? Uh, as, as Thomas puts in his poem, a hankering after an imagined past. It can be a vice. But it could also be, I think as everyone's talked about, um, a turning aside to a glimpse of an eternal home, right? It can be an, a taste of a good which reminds us of the good in which it participates. Uh, and Thomas's allusion here to Matthew 13 and the parable, the two parables there, they're sort of like one verse parables, right? Um, where, where Jesus talks about the, the um, merchant who finds the pearl of great price and, and, the, and then buys um, the, the field. Uh, to get that pearl. Uh, one way of reading that parable is that um, Jesus is the one who sells all that he has, including his home with God, right? Leaves his home. Uh, buys the whole field to get the one treasure in it, right? So that's one way of reading that parable, and, and it's a reminder that uh, our, our opportunity, uh, the, the, the possibility we have of experiencing true home is made available because somebody else left his true home, right? Um, so that there is something for all of us necessary at, at times to leave our homes and to leave those places that bring comfort and joy. Um, but the, the reason to do so is to uh, bring others into that home. Uh, and so whenever we experience nostalgia, I think, it can, it, we can experience it as a species of that heavenly hurt, as Emily Dickinson puts it, right, in, in her great poem. That heavenly hurt, or as Cahelis puts it in Ecclesiastes, uh, he has put eternity in the hearts of man, right? So, so nostalgia is one of those opportunities for us to participate uh, or, or feel, sense, uh, the eternity that, that we have been given and that we are made for. So life is not hurrying on to a receding future nor hankering after an imagined past. It is the turning aside, like Moses, to the miracle of the lit bush. To a brightness that once seemed as transitory as your youth, but is the eternity that awaits you. Okay, I'm going to read um, a, a prayer for inconsolable homesickness. <laughs> Maybe I should have read this to you uh, your second month as a freshman, but sorry. <laughs> Actually, I see a fresh couple of freshmen here, so you can be, you can, this can be uh, applicable to you also. <laughs> Let me steward well, Lord Christ, this gift of homesickness this grieving for a childhood gone, this ache for distant family, lost fellowship, past laughter, shared lives, and the sense that I was somewhere I belonged. It is a good, good thing to have a home. But know that I have gone from it, sorry, but now that I have gone from it, let me steward well, O oh God, this homesick gift, as I know my wish for what has been is not some solitary ache, but is woven with a deeper longing for what will one day be. 
This yearning to return to what I know is, even more than that, a yearning for a place my eyes have yet to see. So let me steward the sacred yearning well. Homesickness is indeed a holy thing, like the slow burning of an immortal beacon set ablaze to bid us onward. The shape of that ache for another time and place is the imprint of eternity within our souls. So let those sorrows do their work in me, O oh God. Let them stir such yearnings as would fix my journey forward toward that place for which I've always pined. O oh my soul, have there not always been signs? O oh my soul, were we not born with hearts on fire? Before we were old enough even to know why songs and waves and starlight so stirred us, have we not already tiptoed to the edge of that vast sadness, bright and good, and felt ourselves somehow stricken with a sickness unto life? Hardly had we ventured from our yards when we felt ourselves so strangely far from something and somewhere that we despaired of ever reaching that we turned to hide the welling of our eyes. We know it even then as the opening of a wound this world cannot repair, the first birthing of that weight every soul must wake up to alone because it is the burden of that wild and lonely space that only God in his eternity can fill. And as we wait, this sacred homesick sorrow works in us to cultivate a faith that knows one day he will. That is the holy work of homesickness, to teach our hearts how lonely they have always been for God. So let these sighs and tears, Lord Christ, prepare me for that better gladness that will be mine. Let all your children learn to grieve well in this life, knowing that we are not just being homesick, we are letting sorrow carve the spaces in our souls that joy will one day fill. O Holy Spirit, bless our grief and seal our hearts until that day. Amen. Yeah. Are we talking to taking questions? questions? Yeah. yeah. If you have any. You can feel nostalgic. <laughs> <laughs> so, I've got a comment, I think. It, um, it, it seems like that either or, either exile or pilgrim, you know, sort of uh, nostalgic sentimentalism in the past, um, or eyes on heaven, sort of, that there's, there's some, and maybe this is a question too, is there an implicit uh, notion of the incarnational, which would be more like the burning bush, I think, that for Chesterton it would be appreciation. Um, for Barry, I think there's there's a sort of a call to say we should have good villages and good towns and better farming and and I think it's maybe it's like at the heart of attention in Christianity that's you know like the city of God and the city of man you don't just get rid of government because you know that it's probably you know fallible so do you think that's right I guess that's my question <laughs> no. <laughs> I didn't want you to hear it. <laughs> I think so. I mean, I think oftentimes we think of heaven as somewhere out there and far away. And the whole point of the incarnation is that physical stuff participates in that reality now. Um, which is one of the reasons why we all experience place to be so significant. And those of us who are coming back for homecoming, it does things to us. Um, and yeah, so I, I think your point about about kind of <laughs> paying attention to particular places, either in homecoming or then the other particular places we go back out to, maybe that gives us maybe our homecoming gives us the eyes to see other spaces um, as significant as Sacramento as holy. Well. Yeah, yeah, I have a question. So. So like I know Dr. Klein, you said you don't really like looking back on the past because it's a little too like painful for you. Like, would the rest of you guys kind of agree that it's like pretty painful for you guys as well, or are you guys more fond of like the memories and it's like brings back more happiness than sadness kind of thing? Like, I would climb just talk about yeah, it. Speak about your pain. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Forty-one years ago. <laughs> Uh, no, don't misunderstand. I like my wife would tell you uh, that I um, spend more time in the past than anyone she knows. That's not doing it because of regret or shame. Okay. 
I, I don't, it's not about regret or shame. It, so uh, I do, I live in the past all the time, but I'm gonna limit that. I'm not gonna go back to a place that's like inviting all of these things. Plus, when you go back to the campus, as you'll see, many of you are just graduating maybe a year or two. Once things start to change, so that's a whole other factor that the, the physical place changes. Uh, maybe some of you have gone back to the house that was your childhood home, someone else bought it, and did anyone do the weird thing of like knocking on the door and like, can we come in? And like looking at it. But when you see it's changed, you're not like, oh good, they put a new tree there. You're like, damn them. <laughs> damn them all to hell for doing this to my home, right? Uh, because because it's, so, like, it's, that's a, a, a physical thing that's happening. Uh, so no, I don't mean to suggest I'm not in the past, I'm in the past. You just kind of miss the way things used to be, kind of thing, or, or yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean, don't yeah, you? Right. Uh, <laughs> but it's not. It's like it's certainly a sign of blessings. But um, right, the uh, many of you are not in this position yet, but uh, some of you have been, where you're especially a mother, a young mother who has a small child in the grocery store. That child is acting up. Someone comes up. To, Hey, there's a wonderful child back there. This is perfect. We're gonna get, bring the mother up here and have her talk about this. But you, you have a um, uh, an older person walk up and say, "These days will be the best days of your life." And the kids got like poop on their fingers and stuff like that. Like this isn't a good day. Um, but the thing that really hurts the most is they're right. So it's not like. Uh, and even like soldiers do this as well. Soldiers like longing for fraternal organizations to be a part of something. So it's not just a sign of the good times. It's a sign of, of, of wanting s something that you can't have. That, like I was trying to say, it's not necessarily a bad thing. I'm just sort of rambling. I want to turn the question over like, do you guys think you do it well? And I want to know who everybody's going to curse when Muffet is tearing down. <laughs> the terrible is the monitor. That's right. Who am I? Who did you tell me? <laughs> <laughs> I, I just happened to go um, back to my alma mater a week or so ago. I was invited to do a lecture there, which was in, in honor. And Kelly and I, we met, I met my wife uh, in, in college, and um, we were that couple that got uh, dated, started dating in November, um, were engaged uh, by April of the next spring, our sophomore year. People were like, you're too young. You did, but our parents were like, we know, you, you guys are, are happy. So married then between our junior and senior year, but we went back thinking, this is the first time we've both been there and spent time walking around on campus. And it, it, it was the same, but it was so different. Trees that, and I'm not that old, okay, but the <laughs> trees that weren't really there when we were students were now 20 feet tall and lush and filled out. The bell tower I had to climb to ring that my friends greased in Crisco so I couldn't get up it at our candlelight ceremony is now got a stone structure around it and sort of like hidden. It's like this little enclave. Uh, giant bell tower, a chapel, a science building. Everything is different. And it was a strange feeling of, in my mind, it's still the place that it was. In reality, it's, it's someone else's place now. Um, so I don't, I don't look back at that time um, and, and sorrow for it. There are parts I like about it. Like, Skipping speech classes. I'm sorry, Mary. I saw Mary Darling back there. So, uh, skipping speech classes as a freshman and then having to mature out of that and learn that to be a good student, I needed to actually be attentive in class and attend. Um, I miss that freedom. Um, I don't necessarily miss that time of life because I was always looking forward to what would come next. So the greater challenge for me is has always been not to be looking so far down the road that the place I'm at, it, it cannot be a place I've become nostalgic about later, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Because I'm always thinking about the next thing. <laughs> Any other questions? Are you attempting to answer that more? Or no, do, you do, it, do you think you do it well? Uh, well, right. I, love it. I, love it. I think it, it, if I look back to the past, and if I can be with the people with whom I had those memories, I love it, and if I can't be with those people again, then it's painful, then, then I miss it, then I have longing and I go to that place of suffering and exile and I uh, have to find God's uh, faithfulness and remember all the good things that were there that I can't remember because I'm missing the people, you know, so, so I'm in between. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
Yeah, I walk by Ormston every day, and it's empty. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is. And I can see, I mean, I can still see, I can still see everybody right there. Mm. I can hear Ben back there talking. I can hear Robbie. Um, <laughs> you, don't want, you don't want to know. <laughs> you don't want to know. Uh, so that's hard. I mean, you, you, can, you can get real sad real fast about that. Um, and, and sometimes that's appropriate, but, and maybe that's particularly being a, an alumni teaching where I went to school, I, maybe that's a different thing than most people have to encounter. Most of you won't live in Spring Arbor the rest of your life. Um, but you just, you just have to, the, the fact, um, somebody, somebody gave me a patent line last year that was fantastic. They'd heard him say it, and they said it to me, and I'm going to butcher it, but it was fantastic. Something like, your sorrow at something ending, you ought to recognize as gratitude for the good that was there. You're not sorry for things that weren't good. And the, 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 the more it moves you, perhaps the greater the goodness that was present. And so, you be, and, so you, and so you try to be thankful for it. And you can do that. It's much easier to do that if you recognize that it's a fragment of a whole that's coming. That it doesn't have to be there in the past, it's also there in the future. It's, it's waiting up there. Um, and so I think if you have that broader kind of theological understanding, which is hard to remember in the moment, it helps you navigate that a little better. The, uh, everybody's talking about throw the wet sprocket in here, so just, just to bring this back up again, uh, something that the, the band has, in one way or another, sung about was, is that grief and praise are the same word. So that, that grief is the word for a love lost and praise is for the love that you have now, but it's the same. It's the same con. It's the same thing. See, that's the kind of stuff we need to be listening to, people. <laughs> uh, but I, I mean, that that is a is a powerful concept to me, and then just a simple rephrasing of what what Cam is saying. That grief and praise is just an issue of temporality, not an issue of of uh, anything more or less than that. And 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 I would add, uh, just to clarify what I was saying, that I um, I don't look back at you know, my alma mater in that place I was and see that change and think, what's happened? Um, as you get older, I think you, um, you become more aware that that change is part of the change we all experience. In fact, it pushes you out of um, a, a sort of maybe narcissism or self-centeredness where you interpret all of life experience through your own experience, and then you realize you're actually part of this thing that some other 18 to 21 year old has now come into this space and it's become they'll be nostalgic about you all students will be nostalgic about Spring Arbor in a way that that, that Cameron and, and Kimberly weren't and and as you get older you come to realize that and I think there's a goodness that connects you it's grief it's praise um, but it's also hopeful um, you, you all give us a lot of hope in uh, in the energy you have so we're like vampires we, we suck that <laughs> out of you we, we suck that out of you <laughs> So we can stay young forever. <laughs> I'm not speaking for Jeff when I say that. <laughs> but Jeff will speak for himself now. It's 2 o'clock. So uh, let's chat. <laughs> and informally. Yeah? Okay. Yes, yeah. wonderful. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks for coming. Thank you all for coming. Yes. Yes.